Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I am excited to bring you the second video in our chemistry series. And in this particular video, our focus is primarily going to be on the properties of matter. If you remember from last time, we talked a little bit about how matter is essentially anything and everything in the universe. So this pen is matter. This tape dispenser is matter. The earth is made up of matter. And what we're going to look at now are some of the unique properties that different types of matter have as well as changes that can occur in matter itself. So hopefully at the end of this video you'll be able to understand a variety of different properties and changes that can occur in matter, evaluate matter for a variety of different properties, and then also be able to determine some different types of matter that exist in our world. If you take a look here we have quite a bit of vocabulary terms here and many of these you're probably familiar with from middle school science. So just make sure that you're, you're good with these. We will cover each of these as we go through the lesson today. And again, just keep those vocabulary terms in mind and also look out for a question that should be coming up here shortly. So when we talk about matter, again, just to refresh, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Uh, that is essentially anything and everything within the universe. Even gas is considered matter. If you know we breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, the air that we breathe has lots of different chemicals in it. It has nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, a little bit of argon. All of that is matter and takes up space. Now the term mass, which is something that you're probably also familiar with, is the amount of matter. And mass is measured in a unit known as grams. The higher the amount of grams, the more matter something has. So for example, you know, I've got my tape dispenser here and my pen, and the tape dispenser has slightly more mass, um, it has slightly more matter than the pen does. So when we talk about atoms, atoms are the smallest unit of an element. It's the smallest unit of matter that exists. And those are all of the things that are on the periodic table. So you have carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms, etc. An element is a pure substance made up of one type of atom. So when we talk about like copper, silver, hydrogen, oxygen, that is a substance that is just made up of one type of atom. If we have multiple types of atoms in there, then it's not a pure element. It's considered a mixture, and we'll talk about that later. Now, if a substance is made up of two or more atoms, then it's known as a compound. An example of that would be salt. Salt is a compound because it is made up of one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. And when they combine together, you get sodium chloride. Every single atom of table salt is made up of a combination of sodium and chlorine that are chemically bonded together. So keep in mind, atoms are the smallest unit. We get a bunch of similar atoms together. That is an element. And a compound is a substance of two or more types of atoms that are chemically bonded together. So water, another example of a compound, hydrogen and oxygen. So talking about some properties of matter, we have two types. We categorize them into two types. We categorize them into extensive properties and intensive properties. Now extensive properties depend on the amount of matter. So the extensive properties will change based on how much matter you have. So for example, mass or volume. That changes based on the type of matter and the state at which the matter is in, whether it's a solid, liquid, or a gas. So if you look below in terms of sulfur crystals, the mass there is 39 grams. You know, the more sulfur crystal there are, the more mass there's going to be and the more volume, the more space it's going to take up. Intensive properties do not depend on the amount of matter. So the example for that would be density or boiling point. You know, if I have a, a glass full of water or if I have a, a bathtub full of water, the density does not change, nor does the boiling point. Water is still going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius, regardless of whether it's a small cup of water or it's a large bathtub full of water. So intensive properties do not depend on the amount of the substance. Extensive properties do. So some changes in matter. We have two types of changes and properties that we're going to look at. We have what's known as a physical property and a uh, physical change, and then chemical properties and chemical changes. So first off, let's look at physical property, and that's something that can be observed or measured without changing the substance. So again, you get your melting point or boiling point. If I melt ice, 
the chemical does not change. It's still H2O, whether it's ice, water, or steam. So a physical change is a change in that substance that doesn't change the identity, kind of like what we just talked about. You know, if I take ice and it melts, it's still ice. It doesn't change the chemical. So that is known as a physical change. It's a change in the substance that does not change the chemical identity. Now a chemical property is a substance's ability to undergo changes into a different substance. So different chemicals have different properties that allow them to react with different chemicals. So not all chemicals are going to react the same way or under the same conditions, things like that. And then a chemical change is a change where the substance is actually converted into a different chemical. So what you see here on the right is a bunch of rusted nails. And rust occurs when certain metals oxidize. Basically, they take in oxygen atoms and they react with them and form a different chemical. So iron is a good example. You see a lot of rust on things that have iron and have been exposed to water over a period of time. Well, that water can react with the iron and then produce a compound known as iron oxide. And that's what you see here. So a chemical change is when the substance actually undergoes a chemical reaction. It is no longer the same substance. A good rule of thumb for this, and again, this doesn't work every single time, but phys most physical changes can be reversed. So if I have ice and I melt it, I can always refreeze it and still get ice. The iron in here... Uh, it's very difficult in order to kind of reverse that reaction. So uh, it is possible, but you could think of physical changes as easier to reverse than chemical changes. So here's your question, and here's what I want you to, to write down here for your uh, in your Google form and in your notes for the question of the video, so to speak. I feel like there should be like some in big fancy intro to this. Uh, but what I want to know is tearing a piece of paper. Is that a physical change or a chemical change? And then I also want you to put down whether burning a piece of paper is a physical change or a chemical change. So make sure you include those questions. Make sure you write them down, write down those answers, and we'll give you some time to think about that and move on with our video. So what we're looking at now is we're looking at different types of states of matter, and that's different ways that states, uh, different ways that matter can exist. And you have three different types here. There's actually a fourth that's called plasma, but we won't deal with that in this class. You have solid, which is a definite shape and definite volume. Again, like my pen here, has a definite shape, has a definite volume, uh, does not change. A liquid has a definite volume, but no shape. It takes the shape of whatever container it's in. Think about water. When you pour water into a glass, it takes the shape of the container. And then gas has no definite shape or volume. Because if you think about it, gas can actually be compressed. If you've ever seen like oxygen tanks before, that's compressed gas. That gas is being forced into that container. Um, tires contain compressed gas. So when we classify matter, we need to take a look and think about uh, whether we have an element, pure substance, or what we call a mixture. And a mixture is a blend of two or more types of matter. So for example, seawater. Seawater contains water, which is H2O, and then salt, which is sodium chloride. So that is known as a mixture. Now there are two types of mixtures that we can look at. One known as homogeneous, and one that is known as heterogeneous or heterogeneous, just depends on how you pronounce it. Uh, homogeneous is uniform in composition, so for example, seawater. It's not chunky, you, you, you can't d distinguish uh, the salt that's in there. It's mixed in perfectly, so you can't really tell that it's there. It's uniform in composition, that's what we like to call it. And then heterogeneous or heterogeneous is non-uniform, so for example, cottage cheese. It has little chunks, uh, little curds that are inside of it, so it's non-uniform. Basically anything that's kind of chunky is the word I used to describe. I know it's not very scientific, but those would be heterogeneous mixtures. Clay and water, for example. Clay does not dissolve in water, so it separates and goes towards the bottom. You can mix it, and you can kind of create uh, you know, a, a mixture of it as best you can, but it's still going to have little tiny chunks of clay in it. It's not going to completely dissolve in there like the salt does in seawater. So if you look on the right here with the heterogeneous mixture, you can see the different compounds in that mixture tend to group together, whereas in homogeneous, they're spaced out uniformly throughout the mixture. Another thing we also look at is what's known as a pure substance, and a pure substance can be an element, 
for example, silver. If I have a big chunk of silver, the only thing that's in that is silver. There's not two or more elements that are mixed together, two or more compounds that are mixed together. And a compound itself is considered a pure substance, not a mixture. It's a compound because, like for an example, we have sodium chloride here. The sodium and chlorine are chemically bonded together. So that is a pure substance as well. Keep in mind with mixtures, though, we have uh, two different elements or two different compounds that are kind of mixed together. So there's a little flow chart coming up to kind of help you remember that. So the way you want to look at this in terms of matter, and this is kind of the classification you want to look at, the little flow chart. Can it be physically separated? That's the first question you want to ask yourself. So can I extract, for example, salt from water? Can I physically separate those? And the answer is yes. I can boil the water off and the salt will be left behind. So it can be physically separated. With the sodium chloride, let's say you do salt as an example, can the salt be physically separated? Can the sodium and chlorine be separated? And the answer is no, they're chemically bonded together. So that's known as a pure substance. And then can it be chemically decomposed basically means is, is it made up of more than one element? If it is, then it's a compound. If it's not, then it's an element. Going back to the mixture side, like with seawater, is the composition uniform? Then the answer is yes, then it's homogeneous. And if it's no, then it's heterogeneous. And then you have colloids and suspensions, which we'll talk about later on. So using these questions really helps you understand whether something is a mixture, a pure substance, and then whether that mixture is homogeneous or heterogeneous, and whether that pure substance is a compound or an element. So use this chart and use it wisely. So hopefully that kind of breaks down a little bit of some of the properties of matter itself. But keep in mind that atom makes up all of the matter in the universe. And then all matter has a variety of different unique properties. And that matter comes in a variety of different forms. So hopefully you get the learning targets for this video. We will see you again very shortly. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time. Have a good day, guys. Bye-bye.